don't, I mean, for the coffee break, stay around uh, the terrace. Uh, I will take a picture there. Um, anything, uh, anything, Marcello, anything? Good? At the end of the coffee break. Yeah, so five, the coffee break should last 30 minutes. Let's say it lasts 25 minutes. The last five minutes will take the picture, okay? So don't go anywhere um, for the coffee break. And uh, what else? I don't know, poster I have already said. And uh, okay, good. So I leave you to the second part of the lecture by Professor Lake. Good afternoon. This is the second part. Um, I started talking about neutron scattering as a technique to investigate magnetic excitations and ground states in um, quantum magnets and frustrated magnets. And so this lecture is going into depth into neutron scattering. Um, and then that's the first half. And then the second half, there will be some examples. Um, so I think go back. I told you told you about the energy of the neutron being related, the kinetic energy related to the velocity. The velocity is of course related to the wave vector and the wavelength. Um, that the neutron has two ways to interact with a sample. It can interact by the nuclear force and see the nuclei within a particular material. And it can also interact um, via its magnetic moment to see the electrons in the material. That the neutron can be produced in a nuclear reactor and also in an accelerator. OK. So now I want to talk about the advantages of neutron scattering, why one might choose that. The most obvious advantage for frustrated magnetism is the sensitivity of the neutron um, to magnetic order and fluctuations to magnetic moments in a material. Um, besides that, it turns out um, that the neutron energy and wavelength are very well matched to condensed matter excitations and distances. So uh, neutrons, we can call them cold, thermal, or hot, and we can create them with these types of energies. Um, in temperature, we can convert that to milli-electron volts. And we have um, typical energies from 0.1 to 500 milli-electron volts. And that just about covers the range of magnetic excitations that you might find in a material. Um, and also, for those energy ranges, for each energy, there is, of course, a particular wavelength. Um, and these wavelengths are also well matched to the distances between magnetic ions in materials. So if we take thermal neutrons with a wavelength of 2 angstrom, um, 2 angstrom is similar to interatomic distances in materials, and a 2 angstrom neutron will have a kinetic energy of 20 MeV, and 20 MeV is typical of the type of magnetic excitations you might see in a material. That energy scale. So this is very well matched. It means you can measure the full Brewan zone, the excitations over the full Brewan zone as a function of wave vector and energy in a material. Now, for two angstrom um, electrons, the energy is actually of the order of electron volts, not milli electron volts. And when you get to X rays, it's kilo electron volts. So Instrumentation is much more complicated with X-rays. OK, another point is that um, neutrons are a weakly interacting pr probe. That means that most of the neutrons will pass straight through the sample, depending on how thick it is. Um, and only a few neutrons or a small percentage of the neutrons are scattered. 
And this makes, so there are very few occasions where we have double scattering or multiple scattering of the neutrons. And this makes the equation simple, makes it simple to compare a scattering pattern that's been measured to a theoretical calculation. We don't have to deal with multiple scattering. Um, so in this graph, it's, a, um, it's, the, it's the nuclear scattering now of the neutron as a function of atomic number of the element. That's the red points. You can see it's of the order of centimeters. With X-rays, um, as the element gets heavier, the, the um, penetration depth that the X-rays can go into the sample gets smaller and is of the order of microns. And with electrons, it's even smaller. Um, so in those techniques, you have multiple scattering. OK, so what happens when the neutron arrives at a sample? Well, it can do three things. Here we have a sample, and the neutrons arriving there are all it's a collimated beam. The beam is all parallel. They're arriving in the same direction. Um, so the neutrons can either pass straight through the sample, and many of them will do that. And at the other side, we have the transmitted neutrons. Or they can be absorbed by the sample. And they come to a stop. Or they can be scattered by the sample, in which case their direction changes. They're scattered, transmitted, and absorbed. So we can place our detector here or here. We can if we place our detector behind the sample, we, we measure the transmitted neutrons. And this is a real space imaging technique. It's a form of microscopy, which you can do with neutrons. I won't talk about that. I'll talk about the scattered neutron beam. This is where the neutron changes direction after interacting with the sample. And this gives information. It's an inf in, this is an interference process that causes a change of direction. And it gives information about the density distribution of the, uh, of, of the positions of the atoms and their scattering power, and also the excitations. So um, this is a typical way to draw the scattering experiment. We have a sample. We have instant neutrons with an instant wave vector Ki and an incident energy Ei. Those two quantities are, of course, related. Um, after scattering at the sample, some of the neutrons are scattered at an angle 2 theta. And the scattered neutrons have a wave vector Kf and an energy N Ef. And this angle is the scattering angle 2 theta. Um, so during the scattering process, the neutron can energy of the neutron may remain the same, or it may be changed. Elastic scattering is where the neutron energy is the same before and after the scattering event. It's like the it recoils from the atom during the collision, but doesn't lose energy. Um, but the neutron can also give energy to the sample or absorb energy from the sample. Um, so it can, it can create a phonon or a magnon, in which case it will lose that amount of energy. Or it can absorb a firmly excited phonon or magnon, and then afterwards it will have more energy. So elastic scattering is where the neutron is unchanged and no excitation has been created in the sample. Inelastic scattering is where the neutron gains or loses energy. So EI does not equal EF. Of course, we have to have conservation of energy and momentum. So whatever energy change happens to the neutron must be given to the sample. Um, so the, neutron the difference in the neutron energy is the difference between the initial and final neutron velocity squared, or wave vector squared. And that equals h cross omega, which represents the energy um, of the excitation, or the energy given to the sample. We also have to have conservation of momentum, which is, of course, a vector. 
Um, the difference, the vector difference between the initial and final wave vector of the neutron equals the um, scattering vector Q, which is the momentum given to the sample. Okay, so now we can think about elastic scattering. If we have elastic scattering, EI equals EF, there's no change in the neutron energy. H cross omega equals zero. The modulus of KI equals the modulus of KF. So elastic scattering can be represented by the scattering triangle where we have KI, initial neutrons arriving at the sample, which is the green dot. They are scattered at the angle two theta. Because it's an elastic scattering event, event the lengths of KI and KF are the same, but the directions are different. We can make a vector triangle by rearranging the arrows. The difference is the wave vector Q. You can do small angle neutron scattering and go down to um, 0.1 but you have to have a very collimated beam. Yes, you can get, do much better with x-rays, actually. Um, if you do small angle neutron scattering, then you're looking at large objects. You can see that from Bragg's law. So you've got a small theta, you can have a large D. Oh, I'll show you in a minute. So back to the scattering triangle. The diff wave vector difference is Q, or half of Q, is given here. Go back two theta Q or half of Q is. So from trigonometry, we can say that sine theta equals two by Q over the wave vector K, where K is, K is the modulus of KI, which equals the modulus of KF. And actually, this is now Bragg's law. So just to go back to the scattering triangle, we could all also rearrange it like this. It was Ki, Kf, scattering from the sample at angle two theta, and this is the wave vector difference Q. So what we have to do in the experiment is we have to arrange whatever is interesting, an interesting direction in our experiment along the wave vector Q, which can be varied by changing the angle two theta. So let's say we have a reciprocal lattice. We want, to, for example, a reciprocal lattice point to land along this wave vector Q. That means you have to rotate the sample until this orientation is achieved. And at that point, you'll see a Bragg peak or the feature we're looking for in your detector, which is placed at an angle two theta from the original incident beam. So, So inelastic scattering can also be represented by these triangles. This triangle is for the neutron loses energy and an excitation is created. So here we have Ki and Kf. Ki is longer than K. Ki is longer than Kf, which means that the initial energy is greater than the final energy. So the neutron lost energy. And it gave that energy to the sample and created an excitation at the wave vector Q. And this triangle represents the neutron um, gains energy by destroying an excitation in the sample. Here now, Ki, the initial wave vector of the neutron, is shorter than the final wave vector. So the initial energy of the neutron is smaller than the final energy. So the neutron gained energy in the process. And it, gave, and it um, gained energy by destroying something, an excitation. And it destroyed it at the wave vector Q. OK, so the mathematics of this is people normally talk about cross sections. This is the cross section. It's the, double differential cross-section, that's sigma, 
double differential with respect to um, solid angle omega and energy E. Okay, so the important part here is that there is a matrix element between the initial and final state of the neutron, the initial and the final state of the neutron in the sample, initial state, final state, um, with respect to this potential V, which is the potential between the neutron and the sample. So what goes into V, this interaction potential, is, well, if we're thinking magnetically now, the neutron has a magnetic moment, and that moment is going to have an energy depending on the magnetic field that it experiences inside the sample. Um, and we have magnetic fields in the sample because we have um, net magnetic moments due to unpaired electrons and orbital moments as well um, due to the unpaired electrons. And the neutrons will see this because of their magnetic moment. So the interaction looks like this. That is the dot product of the field with respect to the magnetic moment of the neutron. That's all it is, except that the field is a very complicated expression involving the spin and the orbital of the electrons. For comparison, you can look at the nuclear potential, which is given here, which is much, much simpler. It's simply a delta function. It's a very short range. In the strong nuclear force is a very short range interaction. Um, that's why it's represented by a delta function, and then a scattering power B. So now we're going back to the magnetic cross section, which is shown here. Now simplified in terms of the scattering function. So this has now had some rearrangements done to it. The magnetic V has been put into the equation. Um, just I want to point out some things that might be interesting. So here we have a magnetic form factor, which reduces the intensity as the, with increasing wave vectors. So this is something to look out for when you're looking for magnetic signal. The bind waller factor reduces the intensity with increasing temperature. There's a polarization factor, which is this part, which ensures that you only see spin components perpendicular to the wave vector transfer. And most important is this part, which is the spin-spin correlation function, which describes how two spins in the material, let's say at lattice site A and at somewhere else in a different unit cell, how they are correlated as a function of distance and time. That's this. And basically, what neutron scattering observes is the Fourier transform of this spin-spin correlation function. And that's something that can be calculated, depending on your model. OK, so now actual measurements, um, how to do actual measurements. Well, I'm going to focus on inelastic neutron scattering, because that way we can measure excitations. So clearly, you need to know your initial energy and the final energy of the neutron. So you need to be able to select initial energy and measure a final energy. The two types of instruments, the triple axis spectrometer and the time of flight spectrometer. So I talk about the triple axis spectrometer, which is shown here. So first of all, I should mention that all the sources of neutrons, the reactor, the accelerator, both of them produce a wide beam of neutrons. So we have to select one wavelength or one energy. It's the same thing. We have to choose a particular uh, wavelength of the neutrons um, to do our experiment. And that's done using the monochromator. It's actually Bragg scattering at the monochromator. The monochromator will select one particular wavelength. So that's a monochromator crystal doing Bragg scattering. You have to produce, and it's nuclear Bragg scattering at this point. It's just a material that's chosen to give, scatter very strongly, so we have an intense beam. 
of that now one wavelength. So it's a white beam here, it's a single wavelength there. Okay, then we get to the sample, which is here. It's drawn with a circle around it because normally we have to cool the sample in a cryostat because we want to measure at a particular temperature or in a particular magnetic field, and that would be the equipment to do it. Then we have an analyzer. Analyzer is used to measure the energy of the scatter neutrons. So now I can draw the scattering triangle. We have Ki, it's just this direction. We have Kf, which because we've chosen to put our analyzer at this two theta angle, which means our Q wave vector transfer is in this direction because it's the vector difference between them. Okay, now the analyzer, so we know that the neutrons are going this direction because we've put our analyzer to collect them in that two theta direction. But what we don't know is the energy of these scattered neutrons. And that's the purpose of the analyzer, which is also um, a crystal of graphite, which will select one particular wavelength. So it'll only scatter one particular wavelength, depending on its Bragg angle to the instant beam, which can be altered. So you can scan that to measure the find out what is the energy of the scattered neutrons. OK, so now a bit more about the monochromator. The monochromator, I said, was a crystal. The idea of the monochromator is to select one wavelength or one energy of neutrons. And it's just a crystal which is used to do Bragg scattering. So the neutrons might have a white beam, which has some distribution as a function of wavelength or energy that looks like this. And we're going to select the neutrons which have this wavelength only, for which we need to do Bragg scattering, nuclear Bragg scattering. So now I'm drawing the planes of our monochromator. It's a single crystal with a despacing, and we scatter the white beam of neutrons from that, and it will select, reflect only one wavelength corresponding to its despacing and the angle theta. And if we want to select a different wavelength, we change the angle. That's what it looks like in reality. It's a series of blades of graphite, and these blades can actually be curved to focus the beam and gain more intensity. The other bit of equipment that's important is now we need to measure the final energy of the neutrons after the scattering event. And again, we use Bragg's law and a graphite crystal. And we select our angle two theta to choose just one of the wavelengths that might be in the scattered beam. And then we can scan that then to select a different wavelength. And again, this is what it looks like in reality this one is a horizontally focused analyzer. OK, so triple axis spectrometer. This is a picture of the one we have in Berlin. The monochromator rests inside this drum. Everything has to be shielded for safety reasons. The sample would sit on this table. The analyzer is inside this box, and the detector is at the end. A scattering triangle would look like this. So now you can do measurements by, um, you can do different types of measurements. So one measurement that's useful is to measure, to scan the energy at a particular wave vector. Does my system have an energy gap and what is the energy of the gap? For example, so to do that, this is now a reciprocal space drawing. We have the initial wave vector and the final wave vector and Q. This is the scattering triangle. And we want to keep Q fixed because we're going to measure the particular wave vector and change um, the energy, which means change the difference between Ki and Kf. So you can change it this way, keeping the wave vector fixed. And then this is used, for example, if you have flat modes, as in this material, you can scan in energy 
Buddha flat mode, so there's one mode here and one mode here, and then you see two peaks. Alternatively, you might want to scan as a function of wave vector keeping the energy fixed, in which case the lengths of Ki and Kf must be fixed, although the angle between them can change to change Q. And this is a way to scan through, for example, a double, double sides of a dispersion. If I did a scan this way, I would see two peaks as it passes through here and here. Okay, the second type of instrument is the time of flight spectrometer. Um, so now the point is to use time and distance as a way to find your neutron energies. You don't use a monochromator crystal anymore. You use time and distance. So, and this is done by cutting the beam into pulses. Normally the beam is a continuous beam coming out of the reactor, or it can be a pulse beam, in which case you don't need to cut it in pulses. You have that already. So here we would have the instant neutrons coming in this direction. We would have choppers. The sample would be here. And now we have a detector bank. These are the little green dots inside a detector chamber. Each dot has a different two theta angle. So the, the method is to have choppers in the beam. We have a continuous beam of neutrons. We need to pulse the beam of neutrons by putting a chopper in. And chopper is a disk with a hole in it, and the disk goes round. And once per revolution, it lets the neutrons through. So that's the chopper, actually, it's a double disk chopper with a hole here. They counter rotate, and at one point, the both holes are open, and it lets the pulse of neutrons through, and then it closes again until the next revolution. Okay, so that's the first chopper, but we still have a white beam of neutrons. All we know is that the pulse started at time t0. So you need a second chopper placed a distance away, which opens at a certain time later. And you can phase it to open at a selected time later, and you have a distance between these two choppers you know the time difference between this one opening and this one opening. So you know the velocity of the neutrons. So having two choppers allows you to only allow through the neutrons which have a particular velocity. And you can select that velocity by arranging this T2 time with respect to T0. When you know velocity, of course, you know the kinetic energy then you know the wavelength, the wave vector, etc. Okay, so we've monochromated the neutrons. We have one particular wavelength or energy of neutrons. Um, go back. So here, we have two choppers, so we know the wavelength of the neutrons when they arrive at the sample. The next step is to measure the scattered neutrons, not just their scattering angle, which depends on which detector they go into, but also their energy. But again, these detectors don't just measure the angle, they also measure the time, and we know all the distances. So we know how how long it took to arrive at this detector. We know the distance from this detector to the sample, so we know the velocity of the neutrons that were scattered. So we also have the final energy, all can measure it. So this diagram is, a, is time versus distance. This is actually an instrument, and it's distance along the instrument. The instrument has choppers, chopper one, chopper two, chopper three, chopper four, then the sample, then the detector bank. As a function of time, we have chopper one opens. It opens regularly and lets through neutrons, but it's a white beam. We have to use chopper two to select 
neutrons only arriving at a particular time later to get through. Therefore, they have a particular velocity. So now we have a, a one particular wavelength by the time it gets to the sample. Now the sample's going to scatter in whatever way the sample chooses to scatter, and it's going to be scatter elastically, but also inelastically by taking some of the neutron energy. Therefore, some of the neutrons will be slower. Some might also be faster. But the detectors measure the time of arrival and therefore also the energy of the scattered neutrons. So this is a diagram of the Merlin time of flight spectrometer. Here we have a chopper. Um, so we have a, the initial wave vector Ki. We have the sample here, this point. So we have the choppers down here, we have the sample, and then we have the detector bank shown here. And the chopper selects a particular wave vector of neutrons, and then the neutrons are scattered by the sample into the detector bank, and depending on which detector they go into, they will have different two theta angles. You can draw the scattering triangle with Ki, Kf, Kf is this, now we have to choose one particular detector. So at this detector, the scattering angle is two theta. Um, this is an elastic scattering event, but sometime later, neutrons that created excitations will arrive. These will be slower because they gave up some of their energy to create the excitation. So they will arrive later in time. They will have less energy. Therefore, the modulus of their wave vector will be smaller. So now we have some inelastic neutrons arriving. They have the same two theta angle because I'm only looking at one detector here. But it's a shorter wave vector. So the wave vector, the wave vector transfer Q has a different direction and so on as time goes on. You can put this into a reciprocal space diagram as the wave vector, as the neutrons slow down or the ones that created excitations arrive later they will be a smaller wave vector, modulus of their wave vectors. And when you do the scattering triangle, you'll find that the wave vector transfer has a different direction. Now, depending on how you arrange your sample, you'll produce some trajectory through your sample. Okay, that was just, I just want to say one more thing. I was, of course, only looking at one detector as a function of time. And there's a large detector bank, and each detector will be doing this. So that's, that's the background to neutron scattering, or inelastic neutron scattering. I want to talk about some examples now. So the first example, real measurements of materials. Oh, yes. Um, yes, OK. So currently, going back here, if you imagine that every detector is me measuring as a function of time, so it's measuring a whole spectrum, and that there are lots of detectors, this many, you can imagine then you get a lot of data. And if you want to measure if you want to have an overview of your material, this is the best technique. Um, as you see, you don't have a great deal of control as to go back to here. You don't have a great deal of control as to where you are measuring. So you have to do the whole thing. You have to measure everything, and then you can look at the data and work out and re redistribute it in terms of that is structure. Um, so if you want to measure at a very specific point and you want to measure as a function of energy or as a function of t um, magnetic field or temperature, it's better to use the triple axis because you can go to a very specific point and then change whatever parameter you want to. So.
The time of flight is, gives a bigger data, bigger data sets, yes. Uh, they give the overview. In general, you have to count longer to get this, and therefore, it's not always an advantage. But there are new sources being made now, which hopefully will be stronger. So the first example is going to be um, a zero-dimensional magnet. Um, so I'm talking about the simplest thing you can imagine. It's just two spins coupled together by an antiferromagnetic exchange interaction. I'm assuming this is Heisenberg, too. And then you can work through this and realize that your ground state is a singlet represented by this wave function. That's down and up plus a minus up and down. And then that's in the ground state. And the excitations all have the same energy and are gapped at a gap J. And they are a triplet. There are three of them. And they can be assigned to spin quantum number one. This is a singlet spine spin quantum number zero. If you measure S of this or SZ of this, you'll find it zero. OK. Well, that can actually be realized in materials. But more likely is that you have a dimerized material where you have pairs of spins like this, this pair and this pair, but there's a bit of weak coupling between them. And then the simple picture gets modified because this coupling between them, let's say J dash, produces some sort of dispersion. But so long as this one is smaller than this one, then the gap remains. OK, then you can put this in a magnetic field. And if you get your field right, as you increase the field, you'll split the triplet. You can even drive one of the triplet states into the ground state. And so we had a singlet ground state, non-magnetic, give nothing in neutron scattering. Now we've driven one of the states into the ground state. So we expect now to see magnetic rag peaks at the field where this goes into the ground state. These things have been measured. This is maps onto Bose-Einstein condensation. Um, so at a particular field, the gap closes. We get a condensation of the magnons into the ground state. We get this type of phase diagram at very high fields. We force all the spins to point along the field direction, so we get a ferromagnet. So these are, systems can be quite interesting. They're very simple. They have a singlet ground state, gapped one magnon excitations. The gap, it can be dispersive, depending on the interdimer coupling. We can also have extra excitation lights, two magnon states, bound states, and Bose-Einstein condensation. So a real material, this is strontium chromate, chromium. This is one of the other valences of chromium. It's chromium 5 plus. Chromium 5 plus. So we said that chromium had six extra electrons. Five went into the D shell, one went into the S, 4S. So now we're going to remove five of them, and we're left with one only in the D shell. One electron only will have a spin half. This is the actual structure of strontium chromate. It consists of bilayers of triangles. And these are shifted with respect to each other. And actually, the um, strongest interaction was believed to be this interaction, this bilayer interaction. So here are the pictures of actual crystals. These are two crystals. That's the black objects. And these two were grown with different orientations. And we, need to, we have two of them in our neutron beam just to get more intensity. Um, but because they have different orientations, that's why they have different angles. So they, have, they point in different directions so that their C axis will be the same and their A axis will be the same. This is a powder measurement. 
of the data. So now power is a function of wave vector and energy, and there is scattering intensity shown here. So the colors, bright colors are the scattering intensity. So the scattering intensity around 5 MeV, and no scattering intensity at lower energies. So this suggests, yes, it is dimerized. Um, the excitations do appear to be gapped. We can take a cut over here, so integrate over this wave vector region and plot as a function of energy. You get this data. Take a lower data energy data set and show really there is nothing at lower energies. So from this, you can say, well, my dimer interaction corresponds to the middle of this band. So my J dimer, this was one, is going to be 5.5 MeV. But my brand is not sharp. That means there must be dispersion. So they must have interdimer interactions. And the general strength of the interdimer interactions is the width of this band here. So this, this material looked very exciting because we had these triangular layers and then we had this sort of dimerized coupling. Um, and this is an investigation of the single crystal now. That, and for this, uh, the Merlin spectrometer was used. So in this spectrometer, the sample goes here. The incident beam is coming in here. And the detector bank is on the edges of this block. Um, and for one fixed position of the sample, you can get a data set that looks like this, projected onto two reciprocal lattice planes, two directions. You change the angle position a bit, you get a different picture. And you can continue in this manner, rotating the sample, and map out a large region of reciprocal space. And then you can recombine all that data in terms of the reciprocal lattice of the material itself and get actually a four-dimensional data set with the three wave vector directions and energy. These are planes through the data set. And then pull out certain planes like this slice as a function of wave vector and energy where we see a single dispersion and this other direction where we see three dispersions. So that could be fitted. Can, now we know our dispersion energies and the, their trajectories and they can be um, fitted and then plotted on a wave vector and energy diagram. This and then we need a model. And unfortunately, although the system appeared to have perfect triangular layers, it's clear, because we have three dispersions, that we must have three domains. And the only reason why we would have three domains is if we had distorted triangular layers, because there's three ways the triangle can distort. So, in fact, our Hamilton is much more complicated and involves more interactions. And our triangle, as you see, there's um, a, there are three possible values around the triangle. They're not equal. So it's not an equal lateral triangle, and it's unfortunately not frustrated. Anyway, that met that it can be modeled using a random phase approximation. And, the, um, and then the intensities can be modeled using a single mode approximation. This is the data, two directions in the crystal and powder data compared to the model. So the point I was making about, you can really do a quantitative comparison between neutron data and theory. This is an example of it. Okay, the next example, so I have two-dimensional systems. 
uh, no, one dimensional. So one dimensional magnets, the next example. So actually, I'm going to now just talk about the chain. This is the one dimensional spin half Heisenberg antiferromagnet. Um, system is not frustrated, of course. It has simple Heisenberg interactions, which are antiferromagnetic between the spins. First tackled by Hans Beta in 1931. So he realized that there was no long range order in the ground state. And so you can write this nail state, which is, of course, incorrect. And 50% of the spins are actually flipped from that state. And this was a long standing problem in condensed matter since that time. But some insight was made 50 years later by uh, Fadiv and Taktajan, who realized that the fundamental excitations were spin-ons and not magnons. So I go back to the chain. Of course, it shouldn't show long-range order as I've drawn, but this is over a short distance, it might show some short-range order. So I say this is an approximate ground state. We can create an excitation. So I want to talk about spin-ons now. We can create an excitation by flipping a spin like this one, and it's cost energy here and here because we have antiferromagnetic interactions, but we have parallel aligned spins. So it's cost 2j, one here and one here. But if I flip three spins, it would have cost the same amount of energy, one j here and j here, because this is where we have the ferromagnetically aligned spins. We do five spins gain energy here and here. So each of these excited states, or proximate excited states, actually have the same energy. And so some combination of these has to be considered to consider the true excitations. And it turns out that the excitations really can be considered as these endpoints of this flipped over region. But now you see the issue, because we had, it was a spin half system. The spin was pointing down, and the neutron forced it to point up. So the change in spin was one. But that quickly disintegrates into two spin half objects at each end of this flipped over region. So the true excitation of, are actually these spin half objects, or spin ons, which are flipped, which are at these endpoints. And you can see we have to create two of them from the initial spin flip. So, spin-ons are fractional spin half particles. You cannot create them with the neutron scattering. The neutron scattering rule is delta S is one. So we can't create just one spin-on. We have to create two or multiple pairs. The individual spin-on might have a dispersion in wave vector and energy that looks like this. But we never see that because we can't create one. Instead, we have to create two. Um, and that's what leads to what's known as the spin-on continuum. If you create a spin-on here and a spin-on here, these two, or these two, we have wave vector one, wave vector two, energy one, energy two. So if you add to give the wave vectors energies, the actual energy wave vector the neutron has to give up is something over uh, here, I think. The sum of the wave vectors and the sum of the energies, if it's this and this. Or you can take a different pair of wave vector and energy. And you'll get a and you'll observe that at a different place. And for each pair of spin-ons, you'll observe this at a different point. Um, and so, if you look at all these combinations, you find out that actually the scattering observed in an experiment lies between an upper boundary and a lower boundary, and is known as the multi-spin-on continuum. So these broad, this broad continuous scattering shown here 
is actually a consequence of creating two particles in the scattering event. OK, so back to the theories. Um, there were various other theories used to tackle the Muller ansatz. Also, it can be tackled by field theory, this problem. But then in 2006, Jean Sebastian Coe and his colleagues tackled the problem and were able to solve it to very high order. And this was then 75 years after it was originally proposed. And their prediction, I mean, this is their prediction for the spin on continuum as a function of wave vector energy, which can be directly compared to the neutron scattering data. OK, so now what would we compare it to? We needed a sample, and the sample could be potassium copper trifluoride, which has copper ions, 2 plus, uh, copper 2 plus, yes. I think it's, it's a, what is the kind of scale? Well, I can show you some line plots later, but the red is intense and blue is weak and dark blue is background. But I'll also show some line plots later. The compound is potassium copper trifluoride with spin half ions from copper has a strong interaction due to orbital ordering just in one direction of the crystal. It's actually a tetragonal, um, has a tetragonal crystal system, and the chains lie along the C axis, that's a unique axis, and the A and B, the interactions along the A and B plane are much weaker than they are along the C axis. It has interchain coupling though, just a few percent, but this is enough to give rise to long-range magnetic order. So, as usual, the, the real material cannot reproduce the model, ideally. So, a Hamiltonian is coupling along the chain and then weak interchain coupling. The experiments were performed on the time-of-flight spectrometer called MAPS. This is the actual raw data without any background subtraction. This is the wave vector along the chain direction, as a, and, and this is the energy. And the excitations are shown, as, now we have the color scale. The excitations are shown um, by the colors, with strong excitations at the pi point and weak at zero, and then again at pi. And the scattering actually extends a little bit upwards into this region. So I've drawn over the two spin on continuum where it would be expected. Just to show you that we have interchain coupling, this is the dispersion perpendicular to the chain, so we see a weak dispersion. This is due to the interchain coupling. But here the energy is about 12 MeV compared to 50 MeV. So after background subtraction, um, this is the actual data from the sample to be compared with the theory from John Sebastian Coe. Obviously, these are just color plots. They don't really tell you any details. So you can take actual cuts through the data at constant wave vectors going upwards in energy. And these are the red points shown here. So this one would be this one. And then this would be this, and then this. And then the lines through the data, the solid, the solid blue line is the theory of Jean-Sebastian Coe. And then there are other theories. That's the pink line is the muller ansatz And the dotted line is also the theory of Jean-Sebastian Coe, but not taking account of all scattering events. You can also do the cuts. At constant energy, see down here we see two peaks. They disperse apart. At the top, we just see one broad feature. And again, it's compared to the theories. And the, the accurate theory is the solid blue line. OK, so now five minutes left. I will talk about 
um, some two-dimensional magnets, first unfrustrated and then frustrated. So square lattice is unfrustrated. It's a two-dimensional magnet. This is a spin half square lattice, oh no, spin five half square lattice, rubidium manganese fluoride. Manganese has spin five halves. This is a, th a theoretical prediction for the excitations using spin wave theory. Um, we, don't ex we expect spin wave theory to be accurate. If you take a cut at constant energy through the theory, you would expect to see rings of dispersion. You see the dispersion cones coming out of the Bragg peaks. And indeed, that's what you see. This is actually now the data. This is the data at a low energy. We see the dots. If you increase the energy, you see the rings. And at the very top, the rings merge. These are sharp rings, resolution limited, what you would expect. Triangular lattice. This is a triangular lattice. It does actually develop long range order with 120 degree type ordering. Theoretical predictions are that you spin wave theory works to a degree, but for spin half, it becomes increasingly problematic at high energies where you see continuum scattering. There's also a, a renormalization of the energy scale. But spin wave theory works to a degree, and you see sharp excitations and sharp rings. Now to the Kagame. I mentioned this a bit earlier. The Kagame's corner sharing triangles. In the classical case, spin wave theory tends to work um, adequately. But if you go to spin half, and this is now the example of Herbert Smithite that I was mentioning earlier, this is what you see in the constant energy slices. You see rings, but the rings are broad and merged together. You never see sharp rings. And this is a sign of continuum scattering rather than sharp magnon excitations. And continuum scattering says you've got multiple particles. And it could be an indication of having spin-on excitations. Now it comes to the final example, which is this material calcium chromate. This is material that didn't start from a theory. It was a material that looked interesting just because it didn't have any long-range magnetic order. The structure is very complicated and consists of corner-sharing triangles, but each triangle it is, in fact, a Kagame system of Kagame bilayers, but the triangles have different sizes. And the two layers, the triangles and two layers, also have different sizes from each other. So this system seems to behave like a spin liquid with broad excitations. These are the actual crystals. This is the data. Now it's going up in energy. The data is always broad. Never see sharp rings. And if you take a cut as a function of energy in wave vector, Look at this one first. We see these broad features again. This is the magnetic scattering. This is a different direction. We also see this broad magnetic scattering. And then this sharp scattering is actually a phonon. And that shows you the resolution compared to the magnetic signal. So it turned out that this material, um, Oh, sorry, just, this is more data. So it turned out that this material has a low energy scale, and so it's possible to put it in a magnetic field strong enough to force all the spins to point along the field's direction. So this is the magnetization, and the magnetization saturates at 12 Tesla. So although it appears to have diffuse scattering and behave like a spin liquid, if you force it to be a ferromagnet by putting it in a magnetic field, you force our ferromagnetic ground state, this simplifies the theory, it gets rid of the quantum fluctuations, and you, you should see spin wave excitations. And then these spin wave excitations can be fitted to get the exchange interactions so that we can know our Hamiltonian. So that's what was done. It was put in a strong magnetic field to force all the spins to point along the field direction. 
the excitations were measured compared to spin wave theory to extract the exchange interactions. And this was the final model with um, the color coding for the exchange interactions matching the colors of the bonds shown on here. Green is ferromagnetic and blue is antiferromagnetic. And there's two green triangles and two blue triangles, and then there's an interlayer coupling. Five interactions in total, and that's just the simple model. So having got a Hamiltonian, the question is why, at least in zero magnetic fields, why does this system appear not to have any long range order and have broad excitations? What is special about this Hamiltonian? Well then it was compared to the method of pseudo fermion functional renormalization group, which was able to show that with this set of interactions, no long-range order would be expected. And it was also, this, this technique was also able to um, calculate the expected scattering and showed diffuse ring-like features with a sort of qual qualitative analogy to what we observe. Okay. So this was an example of where, in fact, the material was found before the model was found. So I will stop now and just summarize. Um, talked about conventional magnets with long range order and spin wave excitations. Unconventional magnets, in particular frustrated magnets, do not have long range order in the ground state um, and stay have spin-on excitations, and they can arise from geometric frustration, competing interactions, or anisotropy. And they can be measured using various techniques, in particular neutron scattering, which triple-axis spectrometer or the time-of-flight spectrometer. And there are many examples of quantitative comparison of theory and experiment shown here. Thank you.